Hey there, Mission Control. Thanks for joining in. Uh, today we're going to talk about insulation and things that we need to consider when installing insulation. Now, as everyone has pretty much pointed out, I did not think about insulation. I should have. Shame on me. I didn't. I thought about a lot of other things, but I didn't think about that. So that's a big problem. Some things that we have to consider when we're installing insulation. First is access to the grow lanes when we install the insulation. The reason that we have tents installed right now, uh, this tent behind me here for example, is because it's easy to get in and get out of so that you can actually access the microgreens and you can get in there to feed the fish that you have to do every day. So uh, we actually have plastic over the top of the fish tanks right now to help capture humidity. And it is kind of a problem, you know, you got to reach down there, you got to lift up the plastic, you got to roll it all up, throw your fish food in, and you got to come back, you got to check for the fish food, you got to make sure there's not any extra fish food in there. So uh, you have to think about it from an operator perspective, being the person who actually operates the system. You know, is it going to be easy for them? Is it going to be hard for them? So when we install the insulation, it has to be easy for them. One of the problems we have with dead air space in this building is that the skin uh, right here is certainly airtight. And down at the bottom, uh, it's going to be airtight because it's sealed with dirt down there. Uh, but if we were to put a layer of fabric on the inside right here, which is what I think all of us are thinking is the right idea, the challenge is, is that the ends of the building are not airtight. Uh, so that means we would not actually have dead airspace. So we would have to seal the ends of the building first, and then we would have to put the inside fabric in in order to make that work. Uh, this screen right here, or this, sorry, not screen, uh, this sheet of plastic here is PVC, uh, woven PVC, very strong. Right now it's holding back a whole bunch of snow. Uh, it is sealed down at the bottom. Uh, there's a bunch of dirt. It's just sealed by earth. Just moved in over the top of it. It has a flat that goes underneath and you just pile a bunch of dirt on top of it. If we have this sheet on the inside, I'm just thinking I'll probably do the same thing, is have that sheet come down and have a piece come out that we put earth on top of in order to create the seal. That's what my thinking is right now. A, a big problem with this whole thing is how big the building is. Uh, I looked at pieces of plastic online and to get a piece of plastic that's big enough for this building, the building is 80 feet long by 40 feet wide by 22 feet tall. And by my estimates, we need about a 75 foot piece of plastic to go all the way on the inside when you consider the curvature and everything that's in here with a little extra to spare. So finding a 75 foot wide by 80 foot long piece of plastic proved to be a fairly expensive operation. Uh, by the time I added up the cost of all the plastic and all the pieces that you need, the clamps, everything to hold it on, uh, we were at about $1,200 for insulation and that didn't include sealing the ends in, which will take another uh, what is that? They're 40 feet by 22, so we need a 40, 40 foot wide by 22 foot tall piece of plastic to seal the, the ends. And that's going to be key, because if we don't seal the ends, then we won't have any dead air space. This is not a greenhouse. This is a, a, a fabric covered building. And one of the key reasons for that, by the way, is because of cost. Uh, we had a very limited budget to put this all together, and I found this building, and I got it here from China. And it was, uh, what was it? It was about $10,000 uh, with the import fees. You, uh, unfortunately, I'd love to buy American, uh, but the closest thing in America was $20,000, and that would have been almost all of our budget. So that wasn't going to work. Uh, we wouldn't have been able to get all this stuff put in. Um, I needed it to be strong. That's why the PVC is really big. I mean, look at all the snow that's out there. There's a lot there. So just having polyethylene on it, I didn't think would be strong enough. I wanted it to hold up to winds. We can have tornado, like T1 uh, size power windstorms up here. So the, the woven fabric really appealed to me for that purpose. It's not a great greenhouse fabric, but one of the things that we did get out of it is in the summertime, because it's white, it's actually reflecting the sunlight and actually keeps it a lot cooler in here. There's still some light coming through that helps offset the need to use electric lighting, but uh, not enough to really keep everything growing. So that's why we have the lights here as well. Whereas a normal greenhouse, you wouldn't have to have lights, it would just be growing all the time. Uh, okay, 
big piece of plastic. Each section here, this section, over to this section, is 10 feet. So, what is that, a little bit over three meters. Uh, they do sell 20 foot by 100 foot sections of plastic on retail shelves, meaning no custom, don't have to pay expensive fees. You can go to Home Depot and get it. I think that might be the right thing to do. So, start here. And cover this one all the way down here with a single sheet of plastic. I think that might be the way to go. Now, the challenge with that is you're going to have a seam. And they sell plastic PVC clamps. Uh, they look like C's. And they just snap on and hold the plastic in place. That seems to me to be the most cost effective uh, and, and actually a very effective way to hold it on. I think these are inch and a half pipe. So if, I think if we got about a hundred of those in four foot, or uh, sorry, about half a foot sections, six inch sections, then uh, we'd be probably pretty good with that. So you'd have to put, a, I think you'd have to install one whole section, one 20 foot section, start here, work your way over. It's gonna be a very difficult install without a lift though. We don't have space in here to bring a lift in, so everything's gonna have to be done with an extension ladder, which we have. It's just no fun to be up on. Then, let's say that goes really, really well, and you get this one put on, you get the next one clamped, you get the final one clamped for your first 20-foot section. Now you have to go to the end, let's choose this as the end, and you're gonna to have to take off the clamp and put on the next piece of plastic and create that seam. I think that's gonna be a little tough. Uh, but I think that's the only thing we can do right now, unless you get an entire section, just one whole big section, and put it all in here. So that's going to be the big challenge with this. Now, I was thinking there, there are some other issues here. We have power lines that run up to the top of the building and go all the way over to the other side, as well as Wi-Fi uh, and data access are up there. So by sealing all of this in, we will essentially be cutting off access to those areas. One of the things I like about the 20 foot sections, in here, all the way down there, just 20 foot, 10, two 10 foot sections covered, is if I had to, I could probably just disconnect a small piece of it and get up there and do some form of access. Uh, whereas if I do one whole sheet, the only option you have is to drop the sheet, and that sounds like bad. So, I'm leaning towards going with multiple 20-foot sections uh, to make it easier to maintain and still have access to the roof area as compared to one big sheet. I think it also drops the price down uh, probably about $400. So I did price out the whole sheet with the clamps that we would need and some tape uh, just to make sure everything stays together. And it comes out to be about $1,200. Uh, that doesn't include the end caps. That was on, uh, I think it was uh, greenhousemegastore.com is where I looked. So it's not a small chunk of change to do this, but as everyone's pointed out, it will certainly help us with our heating challenge. Now, you're, I, if you're like me, you're thinking, man, oh man, that's a lot of money. Maybe you should just focus on the grow lanes. So eventually there's going to be four more shelves, not this size. This is an aquaponic shelf meant to have all this gravel in it, uh, lava rock, to help the red wigglers eat all the fish poo and, and digest everything. It's a key component of aquaponics. Microgreens doesn't need this much matter, this much mass, this big of a shelf to actually grow. They just need a, a little space. Let me show you. Just a little space like this. Keep that prop. So what we're going to be doing is building some custom shelving that goes on this pallet racking. We chose pallet racking because of its ability to hold so much weight. We want to be able to take these shelves, put them about a foot apart from each lane, or from each previous shelf, and go up. And up. And up. And up. For a total of four shelves. Now, from an insulation standpoint, one of the, the first things I went to is, why don't I just take this plastic that's right here and 
and bring it up tight right here. That reduces all this space that I have and brings it right up to it. And then I keep the heat in this area and I run my heat in here. That's still not a bad idea. And based on the cost of insulating the entire building, it might be where we go. I don't know. i got to think about it some more. But here are the challenges, and they're, they're everyday challenges. From a heat perspective, from an insulation, and from a cost uh, savings, I think it's the way to go. From an operator's perspective, having to come in here every day and have to move, I mean, the, the thing you probably do is bring the sheeting in, make some cuts, have some weights in the bottom of them, in those cuts, so that you can lift them up like doors. Just that act, doing that over and over and over again for one, two, four, five, uh, five row beds, each one having five lanes for a total of 25 beds, that's a lot of work. And, and it's it's a first world problem, all right? That's, that's like saying that it took me too many clicks to get to where I wanted to on the internet, right? That's a first world problem. Uh, but for us, we do want to make it as easy as possible, so I want to consider how an operator would use this system. How would somebody that who, who eventually gets one of these how are they going to use it? And if it takes them too much time to come in here and open all these doors, check all the microgreens, pull everything down, go up and down the ladder, making sure the ladder doesn't hit the plastic, don't rip the plastic, have to seal the plastic, all those things are things that you need to consider. So I want to make sure we do, and we don't just jump to the engineering solution, but we jump to a solution that actually works for the person who's going to be using it. You have to lift the plastic out of the way, throw your food in there, do that five times, and then wait and come back and inspect. And you have to make sure there's no dead fish in there, there's no creepy crawlies in there that aren't supposed to be there, and that there's not too much excess food. So when we install, when we design and then install our solution for insulation, we have to consider all of these things. We have to consider there's not just going to be one lane here that we can hoop house on it on. There's going to be Four more additional lanes, each about a foot apart, uh, maybe a little bit further, that we can take all the way up to the ceiling and you have to get on a ladder to get up to. So what type of insulation we use around these lanes is going to be very important. Now if the insulation does need to come from the top all the way down to the ground, otherwise we lose heat right here. So there's uh, the water in the fish tanks is 54 degrees Fahrenheit on average. And on the cold days, it goes down to about 50. But if we don't seal this, then we lose the heat that's radiating off of there. So we want to make sure we drop plastic straight down if we do that. A single sheet of plastic probably isn't recommended on this. So you run a single sheet here, and you have to have your second sheet come down over the top. Well, how in the world are you going to access the microgreens through a single sheet? So that won't work. So now you're back to okay, I gotta have a tent, and then I put the tent, I put a, a double row over this tent, uh, I'm sorry, double layer of plastic over the top of this tent and seal the bottoms. The challenge with that is just space. So here I am at the future location of lane one. This is the southern facing wall of the building, which is perpendicular to the southern exposure. So, just for orientation, that's why I said that. Uh, Notice there's not a lot of space here. This arm is clearly inside of lane one. And lane one, as far as its uh, actual metal goes, will be somewhere right here, basically right where this piece of plastic is sitting, there'll be another lane bunting right up next to it. Now, if we're gonna invest $1,200 on an insulation solution, I don't wanna be doing it multiple times. So I'm telling you everything that needs to be considered for insulation. A double walled tent on lane two right here and lane three or, or all the lanes would mean that we have more plastic coming down and obviously right here that means we would have no walkway in between lane one and lane two. Now these were designed to have plenty of space to walk in, to bring a wheelbarrow in and do all that, but because of my big mistake and I didn't think of insulation, it wasn't designed to add even more space into it. So this is a real problem. How can we do double wall insulation on a lane when we would clearly be taking up uh, more space? So that leads to the next thing. Well, put two lanes in a single tent, meaning have lane one and lane two 
all be in one big double, uh, doubled up tent. That might be where we end up going. If that's where we go, and I'm curious to know all of your thoughts, then what that means is we won't execute the insulation project until after we get this lane in, which is what we call phase three, and then we would actually put in place a real insulation solution. And just as I, I, I kind of talk and think through all that, that seems like maybe something we should consider seriously is now that we have heat in here, now that we have it automated and, and things are looking good, probably just roll with it, pay for the diesel for right now because it is working, it's working very, very well. Uh, maybe we should just wait till phase three and actually put in place a really big insulation solution, maybe over both the grow lanes, or you know, lane one and lane two, and then lane three and lane four. Each one would be inside of their own tent that we could double wall. So I think in conclusion, it looks like if we were to do uh, insulation on the outside of the building, the challenge there is sealing up the ends and then just pure the, the installation how we actually install the thing, keep everything taut uh, across the ceiling. There's cables up there that we can attach to, but how can I make sure that everything stays nice and tight so we don't have huge sags in it? That, there's a lot to consider there. Uh, it's definitely, I think, way more than a single person job. So that's one option, do the outside of the building. Another option is to wait till phase three and actually install lane one and lane four and then run insulation over the top of each of them. My final thought is whatever we do for insulation, we have to be considerate of all the seasons and how much work it is for an operator to actually install the insulation solution if it's temporary. So this insulation took me about an hour per lane to install. The, the pain with it is going to be taking it down and storing it so it doesn't get ruined and so we don't have to buy new plastic every year. <coughs> Excuse me. If we go with a double lane tent and there's two, uh, two sections of plastic on that, then we have to be considerate of that because come spring and summer, we get up into the 100 degree Fahrenheit temperature here. We don't want to have that inside of this tent. It'll scorch it and we'll have to add even more ventilation and capability into the system. It takes more electricity. So if we do something inside, it probably needs to be able to either be rolled all the way up and store on top of the lanes, which there's plenty of space up there to do that and plenty of ability to hold the weight, or it has to be easily taken down and stored. That would lead you to, well, just insulate the outside of the building and make sure it's ventilated, which there are ventilation holes at the top of the building that we could open in the uh, summertime. So uh, that's everything that we need to consider with respect to insulation. I look forward to the collaboration and conversation that takes place in response to this video. I'm going to be watching it closely. This one's kind of a tough situation, you know. I, do, you, do you go with the big outside, which I think is probably the right solution, or do you go with something more temporary that you have to deal with every season? Uh, ah, man, it's kind of a trade-up right now. And I think as far as cost goes, I think the bigger, the outside one will be more expensive. But long-term cost of having to put something up, take it down, put it up, take it down, put it up, take it down, having people put ladders on it, lifting it, potential for tearing is there. Uh, it's a tough one. Anyway, hey, thanks, everybody. Really appreciate your time watching this video. If you like it, be sure to thumbs it up. And if you really like the channel, please subscribe. Have a great day.